Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Um, in fact, a timely conference. Uh, I must con uh, congratulate uh, Kast uh, uh, Shesi uh, for choosing it yet. Uh, I think we had um, uh, an extraordinary part of what Romani Kohli and the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations on 14 June, so just a couple of days ago, uh, dealing with the Saal uh, zone and um, uh, having an organized uh, conference uh, in such a short, brief uh, time frame afterwards is really, uh, uh, is really remarkable. I think uh, the question is now what, what to do. My uh, uh, Minister Gallio, who spoke just before me, mentioned the cloudy picture. Uh, and, uh, and this, in fact, exactly the reason why I'm focusing in my uh, considerations on, um, on an building an actionable knowledge base. Uh, I think knowledge on, on all these disparate complex issues that are going on there is key to taking right decisions. And, uh, and building knowledge uh, is uh, nothing mysterious. And uh, it's uh, also not good to do it uh, in your study room. You have to share knowledge that you have, uh, and you have uh, to work on the knowledge to make it actionable. Uh, and, uh, and this requires thought. Uh, and let me say this as an experienced uh, international uh, person, it also requires technology. Uh, why I'm saying this, uh, uh, you often uh, find uh, in, in foreign policy-related circles uh, that, that decision makers think uh, brilliant ideas are the, uh, are the wisdom. This is what you need and then everything will go on. In fact, when you get your feet on the ground into the areas where you're dealing with, you find that you have to deal with practical problems. And, and this requires all three things uh, that you need to make change. Is you need to address people, you have to educate people, you have to, uh, to, to speak with people. It requires, secondly, organization. You have to be structures and processes. And it requires technology. And to get all three of them in harmony makes things work. Just ideas is not enough. Just technology is not enough. Just organization is not enough. You have to find an appropriate balance. And uh, having said this at the beginning of uh, what I'm going to say, Looking to the Saal, of course, uh, me as a German, even as an international German, I look as an outsider. Uh, yet, with a certain, what shall I say, history already in looking into the region, in fact, uh, with the Chemis, which is also located here, uh, I ran a study 10 years ago on Mediterranean security, where we already were looking beyond the Mediterranean uh, to, uh, to uh, look for positive ways ahead to uh, ignite more uh, uh, action uh, and interest on the European side of the Mediterranean for the problems on the other side of the Mediterranean. So there is a history in that. Well, looking at the Saar, over the past decade, Europe has become increasingly focused on security in the Saar. In particular, as the territory could become a new safe haven for extremist groups like uh, linked to Al Qaeda. Obviously, the risks and threats associated with geopolitical change, social and humanitarian challenges in the Sahel have repercussions for security and stability there in the entire region and beyond. When you look into details, uh, which I now will not list, uh, a surprising fact you find is the role of organized crime, uh, in particular when you look into northern Mali, um, and how this uh, descends into the conflict, uh, it offers a lot of uh, lessons uh, to involve people, tribes, politicians there. But what I really found surprising also for donors, uh, of, uh, and including neighboring uh, states, uh, it is interesting to observe uh, uh, organized criminal activity escalated in northern Mali during a period when the country was a major recipient of foreign assistance provided by the European Union, individual European member states, and last but not least, of course, uh, of the United States. And a key reason may well be that external security-related aid was focused on counterterrorism and state capacity. So 
we were not looking at the comprehensive picture, we were looking at islands in the picture and tried to fix the whole mosaic while just working on details. Uh, I think this is a kind of uh, endless story that we uh, can watch here, even if we look into historical studies. And uh, this is a thing that needs to be overcome. We need to have to build comprehensive views on the things and then to build comprehensive actions. And this is why I'm so much focusing on this issue of knowledge base. When now on top, uh, security needs environment, needs climate change, Needs, needs prosperity, then you have this, this uh, enormous mix of, uh, of uh, problems that we have to deal with. And um, I appreciate very much uh, uh, the sections in Romano Prodi's report uh, when, they, uh, when they state uh, uh, the objective must be of the United Nations to bring about long-term change through a comprehensive strategy. This is a very purpose of, uh, of uh, the core of what the United Nations are looking at. And when I reflect uh, on my own experiences in several decades uh, dealing with approaches to security, I must tell you uh, seriously, uh, when uh, NATO and then later the EU came up with a comprehensive approach to security, this was the first time in my military life where I really felt comfortable about security. So this is an important development, uh, it is an important approach and we really have to look at it in detail and look how we can uh, contribute. Now, uh, again a couple of uh, weeks ago, uh, Michel Reverend de Nantand, uh, the European Union's representative for the Saal region mentioned um, at a media conference uh, the French-led military intervention launched against Al-Qaeda-linked militant groups in January had not eliminated the danger. For now, the rebels have fled Jao, Kidal, and Timbuktu, but the concern is whether the government can exert lasting control and provide security as a Islamists experienced and highly motivated desert fighters resort to hit and run tactics. In fact, uh, what you have is experienced <coughs> fighters, those experienced tactics, um, uh, was excellent uh, arms and weapons uh, and fluid organizations difficult to grasp, to understand and ever-changing developing. It's consequently important to, to look deep into this picture to get the real grasp of what's going on and, uh, and uh, what needs to be done. And, uh, in fact, uh, I would not be uh, surprised when you look into, uh, uh, deeply into this, if this development, if we don't manage it well, would move in direction of the present rise of asymmetric threats, especially in the evolving forms of hybrid warfare, as we have seen in uh, Afghanistan, Lebanon, and Syria, and as we would expect in a conflict with Iran. Uh, why why I am, am I mentioning that? Uh, the issue of hybrid warfare with regard to Saal is nothing I have read or heard to this point, but the link is the jihadism. It means when you look uh, uh, where are, uh, where is Western security concerned, it is when high-end militaries need hybrid warfare. This is something that really makes us nervous with regard to security. And uh, it is this link of uh, traditional warfare uh, with smart asymmetric approaches uh, that makes us so vulnerable. And it, uh, us is also, uh, when, uh, me speaking as a German, when we have Germans traveling to these training camps uh, to become jihadist fighters. Uh, imagine Italian, uh, British, American uh, uh, becoming hybrid warriors. Uh, what, what a scenario. And, and this thing, I would say will happen if we not succeed to stabilize the situation. And this is not just a security situation, it is the overall situation of governments, of humanitarian things, of uh, food, uh, or this uh, uh, complex set of issues that we have to look at. And uh, so I wanted to uh, address this uh, specific uh, aspect 
as it appears to me as one of the particular uh, threat, at least looking from a European perspective into the into the dark. Uh, of course, uh, it is of much concern there in the region as well. I've mentioned the issue of organized crime. I won't go too deep into that, but uh, it is uh, obviously that uh, that uh, this mix uh, of uh, crime and uh, political ambitions uh, is flourishing there. And uh, it is uh, it is to see uh, how how these things smuggling uh, of cannabis, uh, resin, uh, cocaine smuggling uh, has uh, developed out of uh, uh, well traditions. Uh, uh, then suddenly uh, finding out that modern logistics doesn't require the old traditional logistics any longer, uh, that uh, people need uh, to uh, make money somehow uh, to finance uh, their <coughs> families, and then uh, if nobody looks at it, uh, things can happen. On top came this kidnapping uh, for ransom, and again, when you look into that, uh, you find uh, particular uh, Western governments uh, financing uh, which is again something that is worrying us very much because uh, uh, as we are concerned to get the hostages free, uh, we even urge uh, governments uh, in place to release criminals again that they have been hunting and that we urge them to hunt before. So what a, what a, what a strange setup you know, and then still pushing money into the region. So, uh, so this, uh, if we don't take this as, uh, issue serious, we cannot uh, uh, hope neither that politics manages the issues well, uh, nor that security uh, gets improved, uh, nor that people have the better uh, ways to earn money. Spill over from Mali is my uh, my next uh, thing, uh, uh, and and in a way this is linked uh, to the Tuareg people, and I just take them as uh, one for others that perhaps are not named and should be named as well. But uh, uh, we had uh, already this mentioning of balkanization. Uh, uh, I thought uh, it, per intuition of uh, the Kurds actually, some of the, the Tuareg, uh, like the Kurds uh, of uh, Africa, uh, not belonging anywhere, nobody caring about them, and then in the end starving away, uh, driven into the desert. Uh, and, uh, and and fought against them effectively by by everybody. This is uh, this uh, is a clear indication that we have to look much deeper into historical roots, uh, into uh, uh, these different ways of lives uh, that people have, and uh, providing them opportunities uh, uh, to get along with their uh, families. Uh, just look at these uh, poor guys uh, coming from uh, Libya. Uh, uh, fighting, having to fight uh, part of them their way through to get back, uh, finding their uh, families uh, dying uh, because of uh, lack of income, having lost their own income. Uh, it's, uh, this is not, uh, uh, this is a hopeless uh, situation and uh, we, we should care, we uh, is, are the governments in place, uh, but of course uh, also the donor, in particular the donor nations, uh, the global community has to take care that people don't are not driven into uh, these situations. Uh, here we have to look into that and, uh, and do something, uh, something about it. Next point, cui bono. Uh, I think I find it always very helpful when you look into uh, disastrous situations that you look uh, who is actually profiting uh, from it and uh, who is losing, who wins, who lose. It gives you an immediate uh, idea of, uh, uh, of what's going on and. Uh, who's uh, taking what, uh, what uh, steps, uh, why. Uh, when you look, um, all states with Tuareg minorities have in the future to expect less resistance from them. This is uh, a natural outcome uh, of the things that are going on right now. Uh, they uh, can exploit their natural resources with less challenges. Uh, actually, uh, one of the biggest uh, winners is when you look into that, uh, uh, the Algeria State Energy Group, Sonatrek, uh, uh, that uh, will have uh, a clear advantage. And uh, uh, I recall uh, that um, uh, while Algeria has uh, lots of interests uh, in the region and is eagerly setting up uh, to get engaged, but they don't engage. We still 
on the situation of uh, 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 of uh, asking them get a lead, get it get it done. Uh, so uh, I think uh, my observation is not completely unimportant. The safety of the gas pipeline from Nigeria to Algeria uh, to be uh, operational, I think by 2015, certainly benefits from weakened uh, uh, Touareg. Uh, since 2006, all deposits in the Tuadeni basins have been explored. The area is located in the desert of Asarabad near the Mauritanian border. Uh, Zonadrek shares the Mali Award mining rights with Italy's Eni. Uh, so we have uh, another uh, another one uh, who is uh, involved in this. Uh, we have also uh, in the running for suspected gold, uranium, and uh, manganese deposits in northeastern Mali, uh, uh, Algeria, uh, in a front runner uh, position. Uh, the Saudis, uh, Saudi financiers of Ansar al Dina uh, actually have increased their influence in West Africa. But also China hopes that uh, the fall of the Touré regime provides the country with an improved access uh, to raw minerals. So what I want to say is, besides the desperate problems we all have in place, there are plenty of international actors uh, involved uh, with uh, different sets of interests that also have to be looked at uh, in, in the things. Losers are the refugees uh, that have fled the fighting. Loser is the Republic of Mali. Uh, once considered as a democratic island of stability in an insecure uh, region. Loser is, uh, by the way, also the US, uh, having invested uh, in the US three triple digit millions of euros to support Mali. Uh, and the biggest losers are the Tuareg, uh, just uh, to, to, uh, to, to my uh, assessment. Well, what to do? A couple of uh, recommendations uh, very briefly. Uh, the region's porous borders that the Saar states work together uh, uh, here. The, we could have a, should have a Saar border security initiative. This is a common purpose issue that we could look into. Uh, we should encourage Algeria to have a uh, more energetic role uh, in the problem solution uh, in place. One thing, um, uh, the third recommendation, uh, I would like to introduce NATO. Uh, uh, forgive me for that, uh, it's, it's normally <laughs> difficult to bring another player on board, but actually um, having uh, served uh, for four decades in NATO and having seen how great it is in crisis management, <coughs> uh, I cannot see why we should not apply the tremendous resources, particularly also in knowledge building, uh, for the benefits of the of the of the Saal. Uh, one of the programs is the building integrity program of NATO that also can be extended uh, to the Saal. So, so there are there are merits of it, as of course of the European Union uh, that I have to mention that is engaged in place. And uh, in this case, even NATO could uh, build his efforts on the uh, already infrastructure that Europe has uh, in place there. So we could have a, a, a reverse situation to most of the crisis situations we have there. Obviously, there's a broad scope for action, and this is why I come uh, again to my intro point of the knowledge development, uh, sharing, uh, building knowledge, and uh, sharing knowledge is, uh, is is key to do that. Uh, we have um, with a uh, Romani Prodi initiative already the idea of building a think tank, a local think tank there in place. Uh, this could be the core mosaic piece of such a knowledge base. And many institutes like the CAST and the Shazi put support for their knowledge uh, on, the, on these things, and we have to build a collaboration environment to make this uh, work so that we can share uh, the information. Thank you very much.